Joan and Jane, a.k.a. the Therapy Twins, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here. I have been looking forward to this interview for so long, I can't even tell you. Your website, I can't get off of it. I mean, there's so much great stuff on there. And I just want to get into it all. I love that you said anything goes. So can we just jump right in the middle of stuff Absolutely. and go from there? Let's do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Well, do you want to tell a little bit about yourselves as we begin? What you're doing today? What you've been doing? Oh, whatever. Today we're fancy. actually happily retired. But years ago, I'm the younger twin. I followed Jane into nursing, in, right into psychiatric nursing. She became a nurse practitioner. I followed her later into that. And she retired and I followed her into that. So we also are authors and we came out with our own mental illness because we wanted to break the stigma, not only out there, but more importantly to us at the time, within that profession, there was quite a bit of, you know, something with the eyes. You just didn't feel as welcome. So to break that stigma within the profession as well. I love that. And on your website, what I keep going back to is the page that has books and booking and all of these quotes that you have on there. I was a victim, but after my victimhood stop, I became a bully. The family used to call Joan the viper. I'd rather be physically assaulted than be assaulted by your words. Oh, my gosh. There's just (laughs) so much there. Where do you want to start? Well, that's so funny. We must be in tune with this interview because this morning my ex-husband called and um, I repeated that phrase that you don't remember that you and Jane said that you would rather be assaulted with a baseball bat than listen to my words. And yeah, I guess he remembered as well. And Jane was talking about a quote and we'll start with, you know, I hear the part where hurt people hurt people. I heard that one before. Mm -hmm. But Jane said, unless uh, there was a quote, that's what was that quote which one there's the one so that many. said that unless you get deal with it you're gonna cut somebody oh, that didn't make you bleed oh, or something unless you, um, if you don't heal your own wounds you're gonna bleed on people that didn't cut you and yeah I, I thought that one was uh, a little bit you know in my face profound um because For sure you know, jones words i just remember because she was also a loud the louder twin let's say i should have been on broadway um <laughs> and, and um it so her words hurt so much and so john and i we both felt it that whatever she said to us felt like knives cutting or something like that and i came to another realization this morning as i get older is um well aa says you spot it you got it Huh. So, you know, what's, you know, a lot, there's a lot of information out there that everyone's reality is whatever they've thought about and could fathom and all of these kinds of things. And, and so, you know, with AA, you spot it, you got it. If I, if I thought Joan's words were so hurtful, I have to start thinking about myself. Have I had words that are hurtful towards other? And of course I know I have, but when it involved Joan, I thought, you know what, sometimes my voice is uh, quiet, but I do say something kind of viperish. It's a little passive aggressive. So, you know, I like to own up to those kinds of things because remember, it takes two to tango. You know, we talk about that a lot. <laughs> and we were talking about that this morning as well. In my work as a pastor, I was fortunate at the very beginning of my first post seminary church to have been sent away for training, in, not sent away. I mean, I'm glad the sentence continues after that. But I was sent away for training in emotional family systems. And when you said, unless you heal your own wounds, you're going to continue that hurt and that bleeding onto others who didn't have anything to do with it. And that is the basis of that work, that everything is generational. It comes from our families and our upbringing. 
that our context, our basic emotional unit isn't ourselves, but the family we were born into yes. and we inherit all of those things. And healing oneself not only heals oneself, but can heal a family. So I want to jump into that and get your all's take on on that. Well, we we have been like to um, make analogies with medical Ill, uh, ailments. So when you were saying that, what I thought of was, um, wow, I had such a thought. It was, oh, well, I'll just go ahead. I'm okay, going to say go one thing about oh, it. I love what completely you just said, said because if one person in the family changes, the others have to actually change because they're kind of in your like utter system. And um, sometimes they change for the worse, of course, but a lot of a lot of the times they change for the better. And and that doesn't mean that you're the only one inspiring these changes, because when one person changes, the other changes. And then that sets off uh, another chemical reaction. And yes, the whole family can start to heal. Oh, I remember um, fat cells. You know, people think, you know, you know how when twins are adopted and they're in two separate places, they're often they often have big similarities as well. But your fat cells are usually developed by age three. And talk about a family inherit thing of what's going on. So when people say, "Oh, but I got this," I yeah, you know, I got it from my mother or my father. Sometimes you got it, yes, through genetics, but sometimes you got it through what were you eating and doing mm -hmm. and thinking about back then, mm -hmm. yeah. So we do believe families have to be treated sometimes instead of just that individual person coming to see us or they used to come see us. Is that a common belief and practice in the mental health psychological profession? Well, I know we're taught it in school, whether or not um, all the egos in the room, myself included, that might go into practice, um, believe it. I, I think that at the core, we all do because Therapy is so much about exploring that person's uh, view of how they were raised and to get other people's views on that when you bring other uh, sibs, siblings in or parents or whatever. It's very, very interesting. So I think because we all explore that, we must find it important. Yeah, for sure. What do you think are some common misconceptions about mental health in therapy? I think a lot of mental health com well, comes from trauma and we can rewind back to when we were psychiatric nurses in the early 80s and those uh, brilliant psychiatrists at the time were exploring all trauma in depth at almost ad nauseum. And the people that had been inpatient here had to fail three other inpatient hospitalizations and all medicines, all therapies, they had to fail, then come to here, which was world um, research and come to find out the DSM, that Bible that we use to diagnose and label people, unfortunately. Um, in the beginning, when that first came out, it actually said even schizophrenia was a human reaction to trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't have to be abuse. It could be a chemical trauma that mm -hmm. your mom, Jane, was just talking about thalidomide, mm -hmm. um, the medicine that women were given and then people were born with horrific um, birth defects, birth defects. So I don't recall what the point was. Well, that we're always looking for a trauma behind yes. what's being expressed emotionally. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even, you know, in psychiatry, you're always looking at um, blame the mother, right? It was mm. the old fashioned thing. Mm. Um, but it didn't come from just, you know, I don't like women, I hope. Because, um, you know, we're the ones that gave birth. There is a, an exchange of DNA. Now we're allowing men in this picture where the sperm has a lot of influence as well. Um, and then, you know, what mommy and daddy said or did is going to have an influence. So I don't remember where our point was going either. Well, first so, blame the mother. First and blame the mother. After that, we can blame other members sure. of the family as well or our outside. When really in psychiatry, what our schooling said that if you're not already in therapy, get yourself some therapy because you don't want to go into being a practitioner and have your own baggage yeah. keep coming up. You want to yeah. check that. So we had already had therapy or were probably still in it. Oh, I, I was definitely still in it. Yeah. And I, we found it really, really helpful because yeah. you really want in that 
session to go full circle as to where did that come from? And you want that person to recognize it because 50% is already done now. You don't have to study. You already got 50% of your homework. That's wonderful. Can we talk about trauma for a minute? Yes. Because, you know, when I hear trauma, I tend to discount my own experience mm -hmm. because I didn't have, I wasn't sexually assaulted. I wasn't um, physically assaulted in other ways. I didn't have these horrific experiences that come to mind when I think of trauma. So I tend to discount anything else that might have happened in my life because I didn't have that. But I think trauma, you know, that's a word that we use and misuse a lot yes. these days. What are we talking about when we say trauma? You know, let's get out of the profession for a minute, but but Jane can do that portion of it. I want to go in the profession and one of my um, papers, advanced papers, had to do with that. And how are you going to diagnose it? So I am from Connecticut, but from New Haven, Connecticut, where um, there was just a lot going on between uh, poverty and racism and <laughs> hate and a lot of congestion and a lot. Mm -hmm. So I went to each hospital, whether it was a regular hospital or a psychiatric facility offsite, found out some things for trauma mm -hmm. could include sudden loss of a job. You, if you were a man and the person you were with happened to give, um, get pregnant with your child and that woman chose to have an abortion and you didn't want that, boom, it, it qualified that man for PTSD. There were other mm -hmm. things. Um, you lived through a horrible storm. You became homeless yeah. and uh, so many people became homeless. So um, a lot of other things, emotional abuse, people don't know how to yeah. even identify it. But long term, that is extremely damaged. And it's not so much always exactly what happened to you, because mm -hmm. like 10 people can touch the same doorknob and only eight people get, get come down with the flu. You know, and we look at why is that? And gee, the immune system might have something to do with it. Same thing with the traumas, you know, why did 10 women or children um, get assaulted somehow sexually and nine of them have meet the criteria for PTSD, but one of them, it kind of didn't happen fully. Why is that? So what we find is like the immune system, did we nurture that body to have a very healthy immune system to try to attack all this stuff? Did we nurture that child? You know, for, you know, was it a full term baby? Was the mom healthy, et cetera? Because, you know, one of the things was we were looking at pre during pregnancy, was there a trauma that could have mm -hmm. caused that schizophrenia, for example? You know, so it's not so much what happens to us, it's how were we raised, how were we raised to deal with this, and did the, a part of that brain only let in a little tiny dot of the trauma that was happening, or was that brain healthy enough, or it, some people think this is a spontaneous thing, was healthy enough to close that door a little bit and didn't get all of that. You know, I read an article about that recently, about a man that's working with refugees over in, in Western Europe. And his work is taking these people off of the boats and saying, wow, you are a hero. Look at what you've done. Look at what you survived. You are amazing. What a heroic act you did in the hope that framing that experience in that way changes their perception of it and thus uh, of, keeps a lot of the trauma from developing in them. And that's, I'm, I'm that that is actually really true because unfortunately, as human beings, we have to be validated. And oftentimes, say two sisters were both molested. One sister's validated that that's true. The other sister actually was living, say, with their uh, extended family and said that never happened. The one that we're, we're, we're denying that something happened or it's something you witnessed isn't true, then they don't fare as well. It's really horrible. The other thing that really helped going back to the 80s where we worked 
is bringing that person Mm -hmm. who has had trauma in their life or witnessed trauma in their life, bringing them to normal, uh, normal activities, whatever that is, but eating, uh, baseball games, um, AA, um, a Broadway play, driving, driving, yeah, uh, out camping, a ski trip. We did all of that with the, the people that were labeled as so mentally ill, and they got better over time. And what happened in the late 80s is they took that away. They viewed that as not necessary. You're going to stay in the mm-hmm. hospital. You're going to get medication, breathe therapy. We used to call it hallway psychiatry. Uh-huh. And um, they don't, they're, it's a revolving door nowadays. So, you know, we call it, oh, it's a mental health crisis. Is it? I mean, it used to work, but yeah. over a longer period of time and more of a community mm-hmm. effect that we call the zebra effect. We used to call it that. Not knowing anything about zebras, but we liken it to one zebra is going to get it from the lion, but they don't mm-hmm. always die. And how come? What happens with that zebra? What I saw is the herd surrounded that zebra to nurture that zebra. Mm-hmm. They didn't say, pick up your bootstraps and get back out there. I know you're bleeding mm-hmm. and every animal in the jungle is going to get you. But yeah, no, they didn't say that. So we view it as a weakness. Mm-hmm. What's wrong with you? And the minute we, diagnose we're labeling the minute you label you separate from community Whew, i had to take some air <laughs> wow that is so powerful oh, gosh. It, i've done some ministry in the county jail and done some bible study there and one observation i had was that every person there was told by an authority many authorities a lot of times that they didn't matter that they just weren't of value they didn't matter. And that had, that was something that was shared by every single person I encountered. Wow. You know, those, those kinds of words um, can have such a devastating effect on, on somebody who doesn't have self-love and who in these industrialized nations has it anymore. Um, somehow we don't teach it. Somehow it's selfish. Um, or wrong, it's um, unladylike, all kinds of things. And um, unmanly. We were, um, I never read Alice in Wonderland, and we've recently been asked about fairy tales and this and that. And, and that, <laughs> that was a tough one because that I didn't understand at all. And so, somebody posted something on Facebook, and I thought, oh my goodness, is that one of the things they were trying to teach you? So Alice says to a rabbit, I believe, um, do you love me? And the rabbit says, I don't, or something like that. And Alice is devastated. And the moral of the story is the rabbit says, kind of like, I know, I know more than you do right now, but um, I knew that if you didn't love yourself first, then if somebody stopped loving you, it would break you. It would, ma- it would make you fall into a hundred pieces. And so I knew that you didn't love yourself at that time. And so I knew you needed to go away and l- start, learn how to love yourself. I wished I really. And uh, I know that, I didn't learn that. No, I didn't child. learn that. No, uh, I don't think our parents did And the either. Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, it's always been you. It's always mm-hmm. in you. I didn't know that. It's always mm-hmm. you. Our yeah. father mm-hmm. used to yeah. say he would lean over and our our. Our house was a little bit um, argumentative. A little. Yeah. We were the uh, Bickersons. We were the Bickersons. I'm stealing that joke from, from a from, lovely lady yes. in Arizona. Um, but we were the Bickersons. And our father would lean over and say, watch how this argument <laughs> is all going to be my fault. And I would say, no, you weren't even there, right. Dad. And it was. It was always his fault. And I wished I had realized that because then I wouldn't have needed all that therapy where I was <laughs> vomiting all of my woes. And I was the uh, bully. I was the victim. And it was like, oh, wow, what an eye opener when I realized what I was. Anyway. You know, this touches on a spiritual concept. If you don't mind that I go there Not for a all. bit. Um, you know, they, the, they. You know, the the religious authorities wanted to trap Jesus and said, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus said, you know, it's all summed up, all the laws, all the prophets, everything is summed up in love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he added, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. And the older I get, the more I see that you can only love your neighbor to the extent that you love yourself. Yes. Wow. And I hear that echoed in all that you're saying Mm -hmm. and all that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, having, um, wow. Well, you know, the difference between a smart person and a wise person (laughs) is a smart person learns from their own mistakes and a wise person learns from others. Mm -hmm. And so I'm smart and I, and I have experience. (laughs) Anyway, I'm always learning. I like to be wise, but I don't, I can't recall anything that, uh, maybe after I'm gone, my son will say, oh, was she wise? But, uh, one of the things I, I thought of this morning, cause I often, I'm living with my twin now in our older age, we lived together in our younger days. And what I knew when we were young, I didn't have words for. Oops. And the word now is she's so much more loving than I am. And you could put thoughtful, kind, all these other words in there. Oh, um, I have a good work ethic, but other than that, I was like, wow. Um, and so I was thinking uh, in my older years, because I did a lot of uh, giving people the death penalty um, with the inability or unwillingness to forgive. I, they were going to have a life sentence or the death penalty for that. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be that person because this prison system is archaic uh, when it comes to hu- how humans treat humans. And mm-hmm. so I was thinking this morning, I'm so much more hateful than Joan, or should I say have been. And I was like, of course, I can't love people more. I haven't worked on my own. Oh, love for yourself. My, my love. So I have to now go back and start at that beginning a little bit one more time. You know, having a cat was very, very, very helpful for me. And having um, a child was extremely helpful for me uh, in terms of growth for, with love. So, huh. yes. And if we switch gears for a minute yes, on your website, Under speaking, it says our favorite thing in the world is connecting with people and making them laugh many times through their tears. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you want us to elaborate on that? Oh, and that and that and that (laughs) is usually so Joel's department. So when we talk about how I followed Jane into everything, uh, we also had our niece um, work for us, and at one point. She came into, she banged on the door and I was with somebody and she opened the door and she said, you know, there is way too much laughter coming from, you know, inside that door. What are you doing? And I never wanted to be a nurse. I had such anxiety, which you come to find out was I wanted to control the future. I had such anxiety. I wanted to be a comedian. I had a, I have a cousin. That used to be um, pretty much a stand-up, but he never got paid for it. Our father made us laugh every day. We always watched funny shows, and I just loved that. And come to find out as an adult, um, if you are laughing, and it's genuine, and you are, you're simultaneously in physical pain or emotional pain, you are no longer in that pain because it's impossible to be with laughter. And a lot of my clients would come back and say, now I remember why I used to come to you, Joan, mm-hmm. because reframing things, often using yourself, um, makes people laugh. And sometimes life is so short, you realize these uh-huh. large issues that feel like tons of bricks is really a sand thing, a sand. What is it? A pebble? A pebble right, of sand. Right, right, right. right. Well, sometimes okay. when, you, when you're feeling better, you can actually, and you've lived long enough, you can look back upon something. And if it was tragic, but you can crack a smile over it, which means you found that silver lining, um, that's, that's actually a healing moment. So when they say laughter is the best medicine, they weren't kidding. They were, aren't kidding, are they? Because <laughs> you are not laughing when you're not being forget when you are 
unforgiving, you're definitely not laughing. And Harvard has a study out. It boosts your immune system. It just improves all. Oh, improves. I'm really into anti-aging. <laughs> it improves, you know, your skin tone and elasticity. But my surgeon, I broke my foot a few years back, maybe five or six. And something happened. I was in a wheelchair and then my toenail got looked like the leaning tower of Pisa. And he said, oh, I'm just going to pull that off. And I said, that's not going to work for me. And he wasn't going to give me the no more out cheese or a Novocaine shot. He tricked me and told me a joke. And when I burst out laughing, he pulled the nail out. It was a really good. I was shocked. And he was correct mm -hmm. that I didn't feel the pain. Oh. Because I burst out laughing. Good thing it was a good joke. Yeah, it though. was a funny one. Because if you didn't get the yeah. joke, everyone laughs. That was mm -hmm. in the room. It that, was great. Yeah, that wouldn't have been. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. So I'm going to jump off of a cliff here. Okay. And if I am completely off the reservation, tell me okay. so. But, all right, I feel like there's an interface here of trauma and spirituality and laughter. It, Breathing connects all of it. That to me, breathing is praying. It was in um, when God, or however you want to call upon the holy, by whatever name you use for that. But when God, that's the word I use, breathed upon creation, upon humanity, that's when that spirit happened. I believe fundamentally that when I draw air into my body, that that is a prayer that God is so deeply in my core that breathing enlivens that presence, ignites it. And there's so much out there study-wise with trauma and breath work and the progress that's made there. And laughing is a form of breathing. Absolutely. And when we belly laugh, that breath gets deep into yeah. us. So is it the highest form of prayer to belly laugh? Oh, what a wonderful thing. You know, I had almost no sense of humor. Joan was the funny one, even when we were little. And when you're identical twins growing up where we grew up, apparently um, when one was called something, the other believed they must be the opposite. There was no room for a little funny. Okay. If, if, well, if I may say Our that. mother called it, you are under a microscope yes. now. And we were. So it was strange. So, yeah. you know, um, at some point in my early 30s, my son said to me, you really can't take a joke, can you, mom? Oops. <laughs> right. And, you know, I want if I believed in hitting, I would I would have slapped him right across the face for that one. But um, back then, I out of the mouth of babes, if he said something profound when he was two or three, I listened. And when he was say, uh, 12 or 13, I also listened to, to now. So, um, I was not, I was, I was, uh, um, I was hateful, like I said. And so I, I'm practicing joy. I had seen that, uh, Buddha and I don't even know what religion that is, but it's all about joy. The Dalai Lama said joy. Yeah. Um, I know that Jesus said things that was cognitive behavioral therapy. Hello. Um, that came from, when I found out the Bible, I had a, a handful of clients that had read the Bible several times and would educate me. And then at some point I thought, are you kidding me? I said, that's cognitive behavioral therapy, you know? So anyway, but love is patient. Love is kind is very simple, right? And I was neither patient nor kind. And breathing also can be a lesson in patience. A very simple one, if you count one one thousand in between breaths. Yeah, that's, you know, mm -hmm. and then if you know, it can cut down on some road rage. If you're at a red light and you are the sixth car down, uh -huh. <laughs> if you see when the light turns green, just count. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand. It is your turn now, and that's physics. You know, that's just that's funny because you want you want to beat the horn and get going. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. This has been so much fun, and I would love to do this like eighty-seven more times, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe on a different day instead of all at once. 
Um, oh, but I do want to let you all have the final word. What is it you would love anyone listening to this to know? I would like young people to know there's time in life for everything. I wasn't, um, I didn't finish my bachelor's degree until I was 35 years old. People panic. There really is time in life. And I also so saw the world negatively. If you could say that negative, horrible thing happened to me, but that's not the end of the story. What came out of that? You either learned something or something really good came out. It was no longer a mistake. It doesn't define you. It's joyous to be alive with that air in our lungs. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> and love really is the answer. And it is more powerful than hate. And read it in any book you want to read it in. But it is there. It is true. Coming from an old lady, I was more hateful. Believe me, life is better when you're not. It can start with a little bit of gratitude, which is something I never learned. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was exposed to me. I chose not to learn, I guess. But um, it goes a long way to be grateful for at least what you have, let alone what you don't have. It's good to try. And instead of saying you're sorry to everyone, because a lot of people with trauma say it as a nauseum. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You don't want anything to go anywhere. Say thank you. It brought up an issue. You reacted to something you you would have been, you know, pushing down. It would come out later. Remember, you'd go cut those people. They didn't cut you or you'd make them bleed. Something like that. The, the <laughs> yeah. You know, the victim does go out as a bully sometimes. As a victim as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's some deep stuff there. Say thank you to all those people yes. that are igniting your buttons. And yes. every nurse knows, and if you don't know, you will know that to kill the patients with kindness yeah. also goes an awful long way. So try it with your neighbor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and with yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you. And <laughs>